On May 22, 2010, storm chaser Skip Talbot is standing less than a mile from this violent tornado. While it appears stationary, it is inching closer and closer to his position just north of Bowdle, South Dakota. This small town will become one of storm chasing legend over the next few minutes. First light that morning had most storm chasers scattered across the northern high plains. The previous day had treated them to upslope supercells and a couple of tornadoes in eastern Wyoming. At 750 miles to the east, Andrew Pritchard wakes up in Wisconsin. The Illinois native is up early to dial in a forecast that has been in the works for days now, and he loves what he sees. An active jet stream would advance a surface low pressure system that would funnel moisture in from the south. Just overhead, a strong temperature inversion would allow for extreme instability to fester throughout the day in eastern South Dakota. Tied to the low was a dry line, the perfect initiation feature to have storms explode through the inversion. Pritchard realizes he needs to get on the road immediately for South Dakota. Among those that sat out the previous day's chase are atmospheric scientists Bruce Lee and Kathy Finley. They lead the tornado research group TwistX alongside engineer and storm chaser Tim Samaras. Lee and Finley make the early wake-up call to the rest of the team lodged in Nebraska, alerting them of the rapid improvement of the forecast over South Dakota. Also starting the morning in Nebraska is Adam Lucio. Him and fellow chasers Danny Neal and Ben Holcomb have been on a multi-day chasing excursion with little tornado luck so far. They look for redemption in South Dakota. Already on the road from Wyoming is Skip Talbot, who likes what he sees the further east he travels. Fog and low-hanging clouds are burning away, meaning instability was already beginning to mount in the atmosphere. Shortly after lunchtime, the Twistex team rendezvoused to complete their convoy. In addition to deploying Tower, Tim's latest in pseudo tornado probe, Twistex looks to sample rear flank downdrafts, a critical storm mechanism in the tornado genesis process. The team also gets the news that Vortex 2, the largest ever field study of tornadoes, will be out of action, making them the sole research operation out hunting that day. By late afternoon, a cumulus field percolates in the warm sector, a good sign for storm chasers that the environment is maturing. At 4.43 p.m. local time, cumulus towers burst through the cap over Alaska, South Dakota. Skip Talbot is advancing on US-83 with a perfect view of the towers expanding towards the stratosphere. The extreme instability has turned the cumulus towers into a full-blown tornadic supercell in just over 30 minutes. Talbot stops off at the intersection of South Dakota 20 to watch the development. Captured by his roof-mounted bubble cam, the Twistex convoy turns onto US-83 North to get into position underneath the storm's mesocyclone, the heart of a supercell thunderstorm. Comprising the convoy is Tim's probe deployment truck and three sedans armed with mesonets, an array of scientific weather instrumentation. Further north, already in position to watch the development of the storm is Andrew Pritchard. He time-lapses the growing supercell off of a gravel road just seven miles southwest of the town of Bowdel. It cycles a few times as it gains steam, traversing northeast at 25 miles per hour. The clock turns to 6 p.m. when Bruce Lee in the first mesonet vehicle identifies that the updraft is reaching maturity. The mesonets, also manned by Tony Laubach, Ed Grubb, and Chris Karstens, evenly space themselves as the updraft closes in on their position. They log their data as the updraft deepens above their head and the RFD surges past. Pritchard, three miles to their northeast, films a lowering starting to make its way closer and closer to the ground. He comes to the decision that he may need to reposition as the storm inflow surges. Right as Pritchard begins to move, Adam Lucio and company have just arrived on scene. They alert Pritchard to turn around as a cone tornado materializes a mile to their west at 6.13 p.m. Simultaneously on US-12, Tim Samaras, Carl Young, and Matt Gritch in the probe truck gauge the tornado's motion. The timing of their tower deployment is a fine line. Too early, the tornado misses the probe. Too late, they'll be impacted by the tornado. Pritchard and Lucio, to the south, watch as the tornado is about to cross their north-south highway of South Dakota 47. It hooks a hard turn and retreats up into the updraft base just to the side of the road. 
At this same moment, Skip Talbot is to the north of the recently retreated tornado. He realizes that the show is far from over and the storm is only cycling for the next show as it spools up the next tornado in quick succession right on top of South Dakota 47. From the perspective of Adam and Andrew, the rain-filled RFD has completely cut off the view of this new tornado. With the mesocyclone above churning ferociously, the chasers knew that a beast was on the other side of that curtain of rain. Carl Young, who is driving the Twist X truck, pulls over onto the shoulder of US-12. Tim signals that they need to deploy tower now, a process the team have drilled like a NASCAR pit crew. Skip Talbot's van blisters eastward simultaneously as screaming inflow winds trip the shock sensor on his camera. Back to the south, Lucio and Pritchard discover that this new tornado has brought power poles down across South Dakota 47. They have no choice but to find an alternate route. Lucio's group backtracks slightly and gamble on the easterly gravel roads. Pritchard, meanwhile, opts to stay on the paved roads, which are few and far between here in rural South Dakota. He has no choice but to leave the storm temporarily. The Twistex Mesonets have rejoined US-12 and are safely west of the strengthening tornado. In the distance ahead of them, Tower stands defiantly as orange tracer smoke is whipped into the winds. On the far side of the tornado, the probe truck pulls onto the highway shoulder and the three men climb out to watch the tornado envelop Tower. The tornado, still condensing as it traverses US-12 to the northeast, inflicts EF-1 damage to a farmstead off of the highway. Tower still stands as the tornado passes, leaving Samaris' detachment to retrieve the 400-pound probe for round two. Talbot, meanwhile, turns into the town of Bowdle. Residents in this small community of 500 are on their porches watching a maturing monster just three miles to their west. It continues to grow in width and fully condenses to the ground, slowly traversing closer and closer to town. The Twistex Mesonets slid in behind the tornado on US-12. Another wave of RFD washes over them, recording another data set, but this time with a strengthening tornado in progress. Skip stops off at the intersection of South Dakota 47 and 132nd Street, where he can take in the spectacle of the wedge tornado. Quickly though, he realizes that he's in the path and needs to drop back south to observe the storm safely. Back to the south of Bowdle, Lucio watches the tornado from 323rd Ave. The mesocyclone of the parent supercell seems to be churning just as fast as the tornado itself. They press on to get off of the unpaved roads to try to get ahead of the tornado. All of Twistex is now on South Dakota 47 north of Bowdle, coordinating their third round of RFD sampling. Samaris in the probe truck drives past the three Mesonet cars pulled off onto the shoulder. They seek another deployment with Tower. By this time, however, dozens of chasers are lining South Dakota 47. In the heat of the moment has many of them tunnel visioned on the tornado, aimlessly running across the chaotic highway. Tim is unnerved and tells Carl to back off. It is simply too unsafe to attempt another probe intercept. Talbot, meanwhile, is on the southbound side of the highway, and his roof camera rolls as the tornado appears to sit in place, churning vigorously over what appears to be an open field. However, it then begins to deviate from a purely northeasterly course towards the highway, reaching its peak width of three quarters of a mile. Now on the path is yet another farmstead and a row of high voltage transmission towers. For Skip, this is his cue to take his escape route. To add to the exhilaration of the moment, a nearby chaser's vehicle chooses the worst possible moment to overheat. Talbot takes the southerly escape route on South Dakota 47 and picks up the stranded chaser to continue eastward on US-12. Twistex holds their ground. Tim estimates that it'll pass to their north as Carl and Matt shelter beside him from the RFD winds. The three men watch as it overtakes the final farmstead on 132nd Street. Unlike the previous properties, this one is completely consumed. Several high voltage transmission towers are crumpled, one of which thrown from its anchoring. The Twistex Mesonets are now completely consumed by the third RFD sampling of the day and most violent, notably more powerful and cooler. The supercell's occlusion process takes over and the tornado hooks hard to the north over South Dakota 47 at 6.45 p.m. 
the Bowdle tornado completely occludes and retreats up into the updraft of the parent supercell. The chase, however, is far from over as storm chasers head east from Bowdle towards the town of Roscoe. The storm is cycled once again and its updraft base becomes rain free. The mesocyclone's structure sculpts a laminar plate like disc. Lucio and Talbot watch the rain free base as yet another tornado materializes. Unlike the Bowdel Wedge, this tornado remains harmless and makes for a great scene the few minutes it is on the ground. Five miles south of Roscoe, Andrew Pritchard has almost completed the hour detour caused by the down powered lines when disaster strikes. A pheasant poorly chooses its time to cross the road, nailing the grill of Andrew's car. We had to drop way south because the road was blocked because of tornado damage. We just caught the supercell again, and I just nailed a pheasant. Not lose control right here. See the feathers flapping up. Part of my grill just flew past, so I know I have car damage. Hopefully nothing too extensive. Fortunately, the damage is only cosmetic, but it only adds insult to injury for Pritchard after missing the wedge tornado. As the supercell's updraft nears the chasers on South Dakota 247, north of Roscoe, they need to reposition once again. Talbot opts to drop south and take US-12 once again, while Lucio and company takes another gravel road east. Relying on the mapping of Microsoft Streets and Trips, they select an easterly route that'll keep them directly in front of the storm's base. At this same time, Pritchard heads further east on US-12 to time-lapse the storm structure as he's had enough excitement for the day. Lucio, meanwhile, had to divert a mile south onto 130th Street to continue east when the storm decides to drop yet another tornado directly behind him. Traffic ahead of Lucio on the road was driving west towards the new close-range tornado comes to their attention that 130th Street simply ends in a farmer's field. While executing a U-turn, yet another tornado drops even closer to the gang. Twin tornadoes are now traversing the field towards them. Adam and the other chasers on that road have no choice but to follow the tractor lines to bail out of the storm's way to the south. However, the field would end up winning the battle against Adam's SUV and the rest of the chasers that fled south. The supercell did not let up, spinning up even more tornadoes, one of which within 100 yards of the entrapped vehicle. Miles to the east, Pritchard is unaware of all of these additional tornadoes hidden behind the wall of rain. The supercell has gone into a high precipitation mode as light begins to fade. The precipitation finally begins to give way for Adam Lucio and the rest of the stranded chasers in the field. The rain has only further ensured that they'd be trapped there for some time. Adam and company hoof their gear back up to where the road had ended. Waiting there was a truck with one rather upset farmer. They would eventually be brought to a gas station in the next town where the sheriff would be there waiting for them. He threatened the chasers with warrants if they didn't pay the farmer for damages caused to the field. Adam would return to the field that following afternoon to have his vehicle pulled out by a tractor at a pretty penny of $400 per person. Twistex would return to the site of the Bowdel tornado the following day. They came across the farmstead that sustained a direct hit, where amongst a grove of deep arched trees is a smashed Highlander over 100 yards from the driveway of the property. The white exterior reminds Lee and Finley of their fleet of white Chevy Cobalts used for their mesonets. Carl Young says that the car was likely a missile at some point yesterday, only to have Tim state that it's a great example of why you're not safe from a tornado in a car. While the damage around the farmstead would earn this tornado an EF4 rating, there were fortunately no injuries or fatalities associated with this or any of the tornadoes from this monster supercell. The events of May 22nd, 2010 would prove to be huge for Twistex. The deployment of Tower would mark the first ever deployment of instrumentation that measured multiple heights of near-surface winds in a tornado. Unfortunately, in the rush to get it out into the field for that season, Tim was unable to install dynamic pressure reduction ports to measure absolute pressure, making it difficult to draw thermodynamic conclusions from the dataset. However, Lee and Finley's RFD datasets were among the first of their kind. 
the capturing of the evolution of this critical storm feature from birth to death of a significant tornado would be the source for multiple research papers for the team. Ultimately, Twistex had capitalized on the storm of the year while Vortex 2 was out of action, proving the effectiveness of their small, versatile team. Fifteen years later, Bowdle remains one of the premier days in storm chasing history, with its monumental moments and legends still being shared today.